الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن استنى بسنته بإحسان ليوم الدين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته On behalf of ILF, we are continuing another session from commentary in the 40 hadith of Imam al-Nabi رحم الله And alhamdulillah, we are now past the halfway mark and going into hadith number 23 and the topic of this hadith, the title is Freeing One's Soul. So let us begin the recitation of this beautiful hadith. An Abi Malikin al Harith bin Asim al Ashari, Radi An, call, call Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A Thuhuru Shatru al Iman, Walhamdulillahi Tamla ul Mizan, Wa Subhanallahi Walhamdulillahi. تملآني أو تملأ ما بين السماء والأرض والصلاة نور وصدقة برهان والصبر ضياء والقرآن حجة لك وعليك كل الناس يغدو فباع نفسه فمؤتكها أو موبكها رواه مسلم Translation On the authority of Abu Malik Al-Harith bin Asim Al-Ashari who said the Messenger Allah وسلم, said, Purification is half of Iman, and Alhamdulillah fills the scales, and Subhanallah fills the space between the heavens and the earth, and the Salah is a light, and the Sadaqah, the giving, the charity is a proof, and the Sabr, the patience, is a shining glory. And the Qur'an is an argument for you or against you. Every person goes out in the morning and sells their soul, thereby setting it free or destroying it. And this is in Sahih Muslim. So, as is our tradition, we're going to go into the life of the narrator. And in this case, we know very little about the narrator whose name is Abu Malik al Harid bin Asim al-Ashari. The companion's background is not very well known as per Al-Bukhari. And we know that he passed away during the Khilafah of Umar, perhaps during the Great Plague in Sham, which also struck some of the Sahaba as well. So let us now go to the commentary in this hadith. And it starts off with At-Tuhuru Shatru Al-Iman. And here, Imam Ibn Rajab, rahimallah, he mentions that there are different views and interpretations of this term, tuhur, which is used in this hadith. One interpretation is that this means avoiding sins. But Ibn Rajab states that there is a better opinion regarding this term. The better opinion regarding this term, tuhur, is the ritual purification by water. And this is usually more applicable to us, this is how we use the term thuhur, purification, like tahara. And also, furthermore, this is strengthened by the fact that Abu Malik al-Ashari narrates another Sahih Hadith in Jamia Tirmidhi where he says, Al-Wudu'u Shatru al-Iman. Yani, the wudu is half of Iman. Shatr means half. So putting that together, it's better, the terminology of tuhur, Meaning purification, okay, meaning will do. And Imam Muslim and other scholars also recorded this hadith in chapters related to will do. The term shatr or half in this sentence, such as purification is half of iman, also has different interpretations among the scholars of the ulama. Perhaps the most comprehensive statement is that. And this is also mentioned by Ibn Rajab in his commentary. He says that indeed the parts that constitute iman, such as Words and actions are all to purify and clean the heart or the inner parts of the body. And there's also purification of the external body by using water and ablution. And this is specific to the body only. So hence there are two divisions of Iman. 
The first division purifies the internal, the heart, and the internal body, and the second division purifies and cleanses the external body. So in this regard, both divisions are two equal parts of Iman. So Iman, yani cleansing the outer and also the inner. Remember, Iman has two different meanings, right? Belief within us, but also it is reflective of action as well on our limbs, or from our limbs. Another noteworthy opinion regarding the term is extracted from Surah Baqarah in Ayah 143. And this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إِيمَانَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِالنَّاسِ لَرَأُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ And never would Allah have caused you to lose your iman. Indeed, Allah is to the people kind and merciful. So here in analyzing this ayah, and we've mentioned this before, looking at this specific ayah, that Allah has called the word salah, as Iman, highlighting its being essential to our faith, okay, to Islam. Okay. So in correlating this ayah with this hadith, salah cannot be done without the prerequisite of wudu. And from this wudu can be considered half of salah. So putting this hadith into perspective, different interpretations in hikam and wisdoms we can get just from looking at the first sentence of this beautiful hadith. So the potency of dhikr. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa continues, وَالْحَمْدُ tamla ul mizan wa subhanallahi وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ تَمْلَآنِ أَوْ تَمْلَوْ مَا بَيْنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ So this hadith shows us the worthiness and the importance, the great merit of doing dhikr. That this is of course defined as the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not very difficult to do, but only few do it regularly. Every Muslim should remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as possible. Imam Haytami, one of the renowned scholars, stated that in order to get the full reward of dhikr, the person who recites it should contemplate also its meaning and submit to its implications. So it's not just about just utter recitation of it, but it should reach the hearts. It should reach the limbs in terms of personifying what we are reciting. Are we really reciting or praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while our actions demonstrate something contrary to it? So in this case, it's sort of contradictory, right? So dhikr cannot just be just lip service and have no relation to our actions or heart. And this is common sense, but yet to many Muslims, it's a contradiction. And this is again the real potency. When does dhikr indeed fill the scales. When does it indeed fill that which is between the heavens and the earth? This is when it's done properly. That's when you have the highest iman and that's when your limbs also testify to Alhamdulillah and Subhanallah. Well, this is the true action of dhikr. So this hadith states that Alhamdulillah tamla ul mizan yani Alhamdulillah fills the scale. Subhanallah and Alhamdulillah each or both Fill the space between the heavens and the earth. And this hadith shows the potent reward, the thawab of dhikr. Look how much we can get just from uttering a few words, reminding ourselves of the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, just correlates to our purpose in life. Our purpose is, like for example, in Surah Muddathir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya wa rabbaka fakabbir. Stand and warn, and your Lord glorify, magnify. وَرَبَّكَ fakabbir. So your Lord, magnify your Lord. There are different words for praise in the Arabic language. For example, you have the word mad. Mad means to praise. But there's also shukr, and this means to thank. And the beautiful thing about alhamdulillah, Hamd actually includes and incorporates both praise and thanks. So like sometimes in the subconscious people would say, Shukr alhamdulillah. There's no need for that. Just say alhamdulillah because it incorporates both shukr and also praise. What's the difference between hamd or alhamd? Okay, so alhamd is definitely different than hamd. Alhamd is, now this al, often in the Arabic language we usually just summarize it as the. Okay, like the definite article. However, not every al in Arabic is an al. Okay, 
Okay, there are different types of al, and this al actually does not mean the praise. It actually means all praise. So here, this al is al istigraq. So in other words, only Allah subhanahu wa taala deserves all types of hamd or praise and thanks. And this is what, whenever we say alhamdulillah, it represents all praise and thanks to Allah subhanahu wa taala. Going forward. So why recite Subhanallah before Alhamdulillah? Yeah, because we always we hear Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Walla ila illallah, Wallahu Akbar, for example. These four beautiful terms of dhikr or praise. But there is a certain order. Why do we always recite Subhanallah before Alhamdulillah? There's actually a reason for that. So why is it tasbih? Tasbih means glorification of Allah. Sabbaha tasbih. That's the verbal noun. And that basically is defined as subhanallah. While tahmid is alhamdulillah. To praise Allah. Hamada, tahmid. That's saying alhamdulillah. While tahleel is la ilaha illallah. So those terminologies I want you to at least be familiar with as we're going into this beautiful hadith on dhikr. So why are we saying subhanallah before or the tasbih before the tahmid? Okay. So it's actually a affirmation and negation. The order increases the potency of what you are reciting and potency in terms of the giving the proper rights and praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He deserves to be praised. So doing it out of order actually makes the dhikr more weaker. So the, the phrase subhanallah means to negate from Allah every deficiency. Like for example, when you say subhanallah, how far is Allah from every imperfection? So we negate from Allah any deficiency. So we start from the bottom. While affirmation of Allah's perfection comes in, alhamdulillah, to affirm all praise for the perfection of Allah. So they go hand in hand together. This is similar to how the shahada is constructed. For example, we say la ilaha illallah. And this la is the la al nafi wal jins, basically the categorical la, the la which denies or negates everything in that category. So for example, we say la ilaha illallah, there's absolutely, there's certainly no ilah. So we're negating. And then we're affirming, accept illallah, accept Allah. So this actually bolsters that whole beautiful phrase of tahleel or la ilaha illallah, for example. And this is similar to how you do tasbih and then tahmid. But this is similar to how the shahada is constructed and shows the potency of the Arabic language. So, by saying the tasbih followed by the tahmid, it has great power in meaning and also in grammar as well. And according to Ibn Rajab, tahmid is greater than tasbih. Yani alhamdulillah is higher than tasbih. That's why also we start with tasbih. And this is because tahmid shows gratitude. Okay, thanks and thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is a positive concept. Furthermore, Alhamdulillah is not just thankfulness to Allah, but it also involves more general aspects expressed through both words and action. For example, like when we do Alhamdulillah, we're expressing the praise to Allah to praise Him and also thank Him by our actions of salah. So doing good deeds and saying good words are an implied act of tahmeed. Okay, so we're thanking Allah, we're praising Allah by our actions. So... Again, it all goes in synchrony with our actions and our iman and what's in our heart. And subhanallah and alhamdulillah together or each fill that which is by ma bayna samai wal ard, that which is between the heavens and the earth. And we've looked at how big, how great is the expanse of just even the first heavens when we looked at where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decorated the lowest heavens with the stars. So types of dhikr. Shaykh al-Sa'adi, in his commentary on the ayat in Surah Ahzab, stated that a dhikr is an obligation that we must fulfill. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدَ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and there has certainly been for you in the Messenger of Allah an excellent pattern for anyone whose hope is in Allah in the last day and 
وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا And who remembers Allah often. Okay. And there are many different types of dhikr or what we call adhkar, which is the plural for dhikr. For example, perhaps the most famous collection of authentic adiyya or dua that we know of here, here in this country or for Muslims in general is that collection of Fortress of the Muslim. And hopefully you should have a copy in your house and this is basically Fortress of the Muslim Invocations of the Quran and Sunnah. This is by Sheikh Sa'id bin Wahful al Qahtani, and this is also published by Dar es Salaam. It's a beautiful copy of authentic adiyya because there's sometimes you have collections of dua which are actually not authentic and from weak narrations. If you want to obviously do something which is the most important according to the authentic Sunnah of the Prophet, those are the adhkar which indeed will lift us towards this great hasanat of again. You know, those adhkar, for example, tahmid and tahleel, which elevate us and increase our a'mal to the level of being between the heavens and the earth, inshallah. So there's many different types of dhikr we can do. And we should do some dhikr daily. So according to Sheikh Al-Sa'adi, his full name is Abdul Rahman Al-Sa'adi, and he passed away in approximately 1956. He was a notable Saudi scholar, he was also a mufassir of the Qur'an and grammarian. And he says that there is a minimum amount of dhikr that every Muslim should do. Okay, as also stated from Surah Ahzab. Okay. And again, as we mentioned, the adhkar, the dhikr, the remembrance of Allah, should be recited with full awareness and understanding of the meaning. It should not just be recited on the tongue without understanding. Okay, again, we want to get the thawab but at the same time. What's the benefit of doing something just for thawab and it's not in your heart? And this is where often Muslims fall short. They want to do good deeds, but again, what's the main point? The main point of the dhikr, the main point of salah or recitation of the Quran. And that will actually elevate you to the great thawab. These are just extra points. It's just cherry on top, the extra hasanat. But the meat of the matter, the meat of getting actually the hasanat is actually in the purpose of it, which is to remember Allah, to glorify Allah be revived in terms of our iman and our action, to make our actions potent. Okay. So when the dhikr is recited with full awareness and knowledge, then it has its great reward, as is mentioned in this beautiful hadith, that it fills the space between the ma bayna samai wal ard. Furthermore, we feel the pleasure of iman when we recite it. So the dhikr should be also done at certain times or occasions as if it was done by the Prophet ﷺ, and it should also be done regularly. Okay, so if there is a specific context with respect to this dhikr as mentioned in certain hadith, whether the Prophet used to do it in the morning or at a certain context, then we should also follow in regard with that. Or if there is a certain number of adhkar done, we should follow that sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ because that is again what he has laid out for us. We should avoid doing it as per our own context if there's also something laid down by the Prophet ﷺ. Okay, because again, we talked about the sunnah and we should try to align ourselves with the sunnah as much as possible for the full benefit and also to follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command on us. Allah wa atiyur rasul. Continue on dhikr. Okay. So there's adhkar or salah. There are adhkar which should be done after each salah. And this kind of dhikr only takes a few minutes, but its reward is immense. Okay. The Prophet wasallam said in a hadith which was narrated by Ka'ab bin Ujra, and this is also mentioned in Sahih Muslim, where he said, مُعَقِّبَاتٌ لَا يَخِيبُ قَائِلُهُنَّ أو فَائِلُهُنَّ ضُبَرَ كُلِّ صَلَاةٍ مَكْتُوبَةٍ ثَلَاثٌ وَثَلَاثُونَ تَصْبِحَةً وَثَلَاثٌ وَثَلَاثُونَ تَحْمِيدَةً there are certain words, the repeaters of which, or the performers of which, after each prescribed prayer, like the maktubat, will never be, or will never be caused disappointment. And these are the tasbih, doing the tasbih, subhanallah, 33 times. The tahmid, 33 times. Again, we said that this was alhamdulillah. And takbirah, which is Allahu Akbar, 34 times. So 33, 33, and 34. And this is a famous action after the salah. This actually is more higher, much more higher in rank. 
and the authentic thing to do after we complete the uh, prescribed fard salah, whether it's the fajr, the zohar, the asr, the, the maghrib, or the isha. Okay. And these days, people rush out after the salah without reciting these recommended adhkar. So even if we're in a rush or have to leave immediately, let us recite as we are walking out of the masjid or to back to work. Okay. So the sunnah is to do these adhkar instead of the dua after the salah. Okay. I mean, there are some hadith about reciting some dua after the salah, but this trumps that because of its strength and also this is the more recommended sunnah to do. So it's important that we fulfill this highly recommended sunnah of the adhkar of salawat immediately after our daily prayers and may Allah give us tawfiq to do that as well. So going forward, adhkar al-ahwal. Okay. These adhkar have to be recited during specific occasions. Often there's a context. We have to try to follow what the sunnah is regarding these dhikr. Some dhikr you could do whenever or whenever you have a chance. Other are recommended be done at certain points uh, during the day or certain occasions. Okay. So these are adhkar al-ahwal. So these adhkar have to be recited or should be recited during specific occasions. Okay, so for example, like when you're about to eat, you should say, Bismillah, right? Bismillah rahman rahim And when you finish, for example, eating, there's a specific dua also to be recited. And there's several. I mean, you go through the fortress of the Muslims, you see these different adhkar. Uh, try to memorize one, at least for the beginners, if you want to do more. But just try to put one into action, one of those dua, so that you can constantly remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from morning to night. Like for example, after eating, you should say, Alhamdulillahi alladhi at'amana wa saqana wa ja'alana min al-muslimin. Okay? All praises to Allah, the one who has fed me, who has clothed me, who has made me from the Muslims. Well, again, famous, common dua, which is recited after we finish eating. Similarly, there are ad'iyah, or dua for entering the masjid. For example, Allahumma ftahli abwaaba rahmatik. Oh Allah, open for me the doors of your mercy. For leaving the masjid is another ad'iyah. For entering your house also, there is certain dua as well. Okay. For example, on waking up from sleep, start the day with a dua. Alhamdulillah ladi ahyana ba'dama amatana wa ilayhi nushur. All praises to Allah, the one that who has revived me after my to say my death or amatana after my sleep, which is like a minor death. And at night before sleep, we say, Allahumma bismika mutu wa ahya. Oh Allah, in your name I die and in your name also I am revived. Or into the toilet, for example, we say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al khupti wal khaba'it. Oh Allah, I seek refuge from thee, the filth and the khaba'it. Okay, and then after. We relieve ourselves, we say khufranak, okay, seeking your forgiveness. There's many more athkar, athkar ul ahwal that we can do. But let's start with a few, inshallah, putting to practice, make it regular, remind our families also of these beautiful athkar so that we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from beginning and night whenever to increase our potency of our worldly actions and also our dini actions, inshallah. And again, just to uh, follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded on us to have taqwa fattakullaha mastata'atum as much as we can inshallah when we're doing for example eating when we're sleeping when we're waking up these mundane actions which are in general not part of worship become worship okay they become worship and this is where the mu'min turns regular actions right, which have no value into value into ibadat okay, we talked about that right so the mubah becomes the mustahab. The things which are okay to do, we increase it in terms of our weight on the mizan, inshallah. Even to go to the bathroom, we, we earn hasanat, subhanallah. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us, the sunnah makes us into turning our lives into earning and increasing our house and our real estate in Jannah, inshallah. The Prophet ﷺ, again, used to recite these adiyah, uh, which is the plural for dua, these ad'iyah regularly throughout the day. And we see this from the authentic narrations of dhikr. Very commonplace. So many of these are easy and literally can take seconds to perform. Okay, like Bismillah or Ghufranak. Okay, on the other hand, there are also ad'iyah which are more lengthy for those who want to take the road of Ihsan because 
they want to try to earn more hasanat, they want to put the sunnah into practice as well. So those lengthy dua do as well. But number one, regularity is the one which takes precedence. And if uh, once you're regular, then you can go for the gold, go for those things which are much lengthy so that you can take the road of ahsan. So for example, this is what Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah used to do and this strengthened him when he was subjected to great difficulty in life. For example, he was put into prison for a long time as well. Also on that road in terms of dhikr, Imam al nawi himself compiled the book called Kitab al atkar Al-Yawmi Wal-Layla. This is very important to keep inshallah our lips wet with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we can. So dhikr can be recited freely. I mean, we don't need to have wudu. And there can be no limit to the amount of dhikr that one can recite. So similar to dua, this is something which we can do all the time and connect and praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and increase what is on the scales. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says in ayah number 41 and 42, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ ذِكْرًا كَثِيرًا وَسَبِّحُوهُ بُكْرَةً وَأَصِيلًا O you who believe, remember Allah with much remembrance and exalt Him morning and afternoon. Okay. And then, now we transition to another topic which this hadith talks about. And then the Prophet ﷺ says, was salatu nur. And the prayer is a light. And this is the third part of the hadith which discusses now the salah and its position in Islam. This hadith says the salah is light. This is indeed a light in the lives of the believers as they are guided by it. Okay. This salah is a remembrance also of what our purpose is five times a day. The Prophet ﷺ said, and this is recorded by Imam Ahmad where he said, The prayer was made the sweetness of my eyes. Okay, and this hadith has been narrated by Anas bin Malik as well. And it's also mentioned in Sunan An-Nisa Al-Kubra and authenticated by Al-Hakim and Ibn Hajr. So it's an authentic narration. In another hadith, the Prophet wasallam said, خَمْسَ صَلَوَاتٍ إِفْتَرَدَهُنَّ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى مَنْ أَحْسَنَ وُضُوَهُنَّ وَصَلَاتَهُنَّ لِوَقْتِهِنَّ وَأَتَمَّ رُكُوَهُنَّ وَخُشُوَهُنَّ كَانَ لَهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ أَحْدٌ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ لَهُ وَمَنْ لَمْ يَفْعَلْ فَلَيْسَ لَهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ أَحْدٌ إِنْ شَاءَ غَفَرَ لَهُ وَإِنْ شَاءَ أَذَّبَهُ the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah has obligated the five prayers. Whoever excellently performs their ablutions, prays them in their proper times, completes their ruku, their bows, their suju, their prostrations, and khushu, their humbleness, has a promise ahd, from Allah that He will forgive them. Okay? And the one who doesn't do it, then it is up to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may forgive them or He may punish them. Okay. And this is again uh, Sahih Hadith, which is also recorded uh, by Imam Malik and Ahmad and also an Nisa'i and narrated by Ubada bin Ibn As-Samit. Another Hadith, which is uh, recorded also by Imam Ahmad and his Musnad, the Prophet says, Man hafad ala salati kadat lahu nura wa burhana Whoever preserves the salah, it will be a light, a proof, and a safe place for him during Yawm al Qiyamah, the Day of Judgment. And this hadith is narrated by Abdullah bin Amr bin As with an excellent isnad, yani it's sahih. Well, this hadith also states the significance and the importance of the salah for the believers who always perform it in its right time and in the right way as well. So the salah. As-salatu nur or was-salatu nur. Okay, then next is was-sadaqatu burhan. Okay, so now this hadith goes further. Okay, it goes further, it talks about what? The sadaqah. This explains the importance and the worth of as-sadaqah in our lives, saying that the sadaqah is a burhan, it is a proof. Burhan means proof. Burhan literally means sunlight in Arabic. But so this act of charity is akin to the bright light and clear proof which reflects the iman of a believer. 
proof that you are able to give your wealth fi sabilillah. Okay, now you're basically proving that. Now you're also taking something from your pocket, from your wealth, and giving it fi sabilillah. So this act of charity is a proof. This act of charity is akin to a bright light and a clear proof which reflects your iman. So a person who gives sadaqah regularly for the sake of Allah reflects strong iman. They feel pleasure of iman in their hearts. Ibn Rajab rahimahullah, states that sadaqah is an evidence of iman because, because people love wealth and money. If they challenge and overpower their love of wealth for the sake of Allah, then this is an evidence of strong iman. Again, as burhan. This is a proof. And next is another important thing which Rasulullah says, وَالصَّبْرُ ضِيَاهِ okay. And this hadith goes forth and states that patience is a brightness. So here there's three different lights mentioned. Salatu nur. This nur that is cool. Then more hotter, more brighter light uh, which is burhan. And then وَالصَّبْرُ ضِيَاهِ which is brightness. But linguistically diya is Different from nur in that dhiya not only gives out light but also emits heat like the sunlight. Okay, but the Quran uses the dhiya for sunlight, thus, sabr actually means to withhold and control something, it means to control the nafs and its desires which push it towards impatience or even panic sometimes. So, sabr means to prevent the tongue from also complaining and saying negative things, it is to restrain yourself is to keep calm under the pressure. And this is sometimes very difficult too. And the one who has indeed the sabr has that beautiful light, this dhiya. And this dhiya is actually stronger than nur, stronger than burhan. So the word dhiya is used as a metaphor for patience, which is a difficult and painful experience. This is stronger and hotter light is also linked to the meaning of effort, like jihad, and struggle within oneself. So when people are able to control themselves and overcome impatience, they develop self-control and they become masters of their own selves. And this is the real meaning for sabr. Allahumma jannah min al-sabirin. And sadly, people do not practice this quality enough. All of us are in need of sabr. Okay, all of us can have more sabr in our lives. People have become, and in this world of you know, instant gratification, very impatient world that we live in. We have become impatient for minor reasons. And unfortunately, due to our impatience, we end up complaining many times. And sometimes people complain against the qadr of Allah in their lives. And this is something which has to be avoided at all costs because now you're going against even the principles of iman, ma'adullah. Imam ibn Rajab says that there are three kinds of sabr in Islam. Okay. There is sabru ala ta'atillah. Sabr on obedience of Allah. To be patient in performing the acts of worship or the ibadah of Allah. The acts of worship of Allah. So it takes some sabr to uh, continuously do the 30 or 29 or 28 fasts of Ramadan. It takes sabr to be constant in your salah. To wake up early. To make sure you do the asr salah during the work times to make sure you, before you go to sleep, do the Isha Salah or join the congregation in the masjid. It takes sabr to do all these things on a daily basis. And this is sabr ala ta'atillah. To have sabr in terms of obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's also sabr an ma'asiyatillah, to be patient in avoiding the ma'asiyah, the sins as well. Because everyone around you is disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you are avoiding that disobedience because we have sabr in the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sabr, knowing that these people, they may be punished severely on the day of judgment. To be patient in avoiding the ma'asiyah, the sins or disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the two main sabr. Another with sabr ma'asiyatillah is also sabr against doing bidah, which is referred to sabr ala al bida. This is also another type of sabr which was highly regarded as mentioned by Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali. And there's also sabr ala qadrillah, to be patient with the qadr of Allah or His plans. So sometimes it's a musibah which befalls us, but no, we know that this is the qadr of Allah. 
when someone passes away which was very close to us, when we face a hardship in terms of work or in our families, and it's not anything which we were directly responsible for, so this becomes Qadrullah. Okay? We are patient with what happens because we know that this is the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He is testing us and part of that test is to have the excellent, the sabrun jameel, the beautiful patience. So one act of ibadah which, for example, contains all three forms of sabr is fasting because you obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the act of fasting. You're avoiding the sin of eating during the day and also you believe that this is the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So going forward, the Qur'an. Then next, Rasul Sussam says, Al-Qur'an hujjatun laka walaik. The Qur'an, it is a argument for you or against you. Okay. Surah Isra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنُنُوا مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارًا and we send down the Qur'an, that which is a healing and a mercy for those who believe. Okay. And for the unjust people, it causes nothing but loss. Surah Isra, Ayah 82. The people who recite the Qur'an and learn it, as well as practice its rulings are people who become the people of the Qur'an. And it is for these people that the Qur'an becomes a proof for. So Qur'an, we recite it, we practice it, we understand it. All these are a haq of the Qur'an. It's not just about just rote recitation of the Qur'an, which most of the ummah does. You know, the Qur'an, the greater purpose is for khuda. And you cannot have khuda unless you understand what you are reciting. Yes, so we have to go and try to learn the Arabic language. If you cannot do that, then at least uh, look at the translation. Be familiar with the Qur'an and its meaning as well, because it's not just for barakah. That is a visual thinking which shaitan has planted in our minds, unfortunately, for many generations. So we need to go back to the Qur'an, its meaning, and act on it as the Sahaba did with so much firmness. And those who ignore the Qur'an do not read it or practice it in their lives. The Qur'an shall stand against them on the Day of Judgment. Okay, this is the miracle until the end of time. Okay. Some of these Muslims, for example, read the Qur'an only when death comes. You know, the Qur'an khani, that's a common bid'ah. They do not have the simple realization that the purpose of the Qur'an is for guidance. Alif lamim dhalika al-kitabu la rayba fi khuddal lil muttaqeen. There's a guise for those who are alive and not for those who have passed away. So what is past is past. The Quran it needs to be recited daily. Invest in the MP3 or CD player in your car. Anytime you're going to work, listen to the Quran or its meaning or its tafsir or the hadith which discuss the meaning of the Quran as well. You can have a daily connection with the Quran Kareem. And then it will, inshallah, on the day of judgment, be a hujjah for you. So going forward. And this is going to the climax of this hadith where the Prophet says, كُلُّ النَّاسِ يَغْدُ فَبَاعِيُنْ نَفْسَهُ فَمُعْتِقُهَا أَوْ مُوْبِكُهَا Every person goes out in the morning and sells their soul, thereby setting it free or destroying it. So at the end of this hadith, its main point is stated, which is the meaning to free ourselves from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This hadith states that everyone goes out in the morning selling himself or herself either for good or for bad. So every day is like a new sheet. Okay, Every day it's a new slate, okay. new board. Is he going to obey Allah or disobey him? Is she going to obey Allah or disobey him? So freeing oneself refers to the punishment which is essentially one's destruction. Right? Every person, right? Every person is in loss except the one who believes and does good deeds and the one who encourages each other for sabr, for the patience and for the truth. This is Wal Asr, very similar. In Surah Shams, 
Ayah 7 to 10, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the same meaning. He says, He says, and by the soul he proportioned it and inspired it with its wickedness and its righteousness. Truly, he succeeds who perfects it or purifies it, yani the soul. And he has failed it who corrupts it. So again, it's all about what decisions we do. How are we going to spend the day? Either in ta'atillah or ma'asiyatillah, in obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or in uh, the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's either one or the other. So Imam Ibn Rajab, while commenting on this meaning, says that the person who struggles to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obeys Him is the one who frees himself while the person who indulges in sins, leaves the salah, doesn't pray, uh, does those sins, is the one who destroys himself. According to this hadith, every morning when people go out of their houses, they are either profiting by gaining rewards or earning losses by committing sin. If they obey Allah and follow His commandments, they are the winners. But if they violate the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the hudud Allah and disobey Him, then they gain nothing but loss. Illa khasara. And this is clearly also explained in the Quran in Surah Zumar, Ayah 15, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah Subhanahu wa says, Say indeed the losers are the ones who will lose themselves and their families on the day of judgment. This is the manifest loss. Allahumma jinnah min hada. May Allah protect us from this. And the key point of this hadith is in its concluding remarks regarding that the selling of one's soul for the good or for the bad ending. It's all for the ending, right? And in this regard, this beautiful hadith guides us to a few simple yet profound actions which we should do on a daily basis to ensure a good ending. Specifically to free ourselves from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we mentioned just now. And this hadith starts with purification which is a necessary preparation for the daily salawat. And through purification we are led to securing the prayer which is perhaps the most paramount of actions that allows one's soul to be saved. Because this is the first thing which is going to be asked of us on the day of hisab. And from this hadith also, in Ayah 143 of Surah Baqarah, we see that both wudu and salah are essential components of iman, which is the first prerequisite in Islam. This hadith then goes on to mention other important deeds that we need to do on a daily basis, such as dhikr. Look at the great thawab of dhikr, the salah, the sadaqah, the sabr, and also reciting and practicing the Qur'an. And those who destroy themselves are devoid of these great actions that are mentioned. So may Allah give us tawfiq to be able to uh, indeed practice this great hadith, and may Allah allow us to incorporate dhikr and these other actions fully in our daily lives. Subhanaka Allahumma bihamdik wa nashadu wa la ilaha illa ant wa sakfikatubu ilaykas salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.